Good morning. I hope we are all doing well. We will start, the time is up, whilst we wait for our other colleagues to join us in the course of the period. I'm unfortunate there's light off here, but I will still keep on with it because it is our sacred responsibility to carry out these very sessions online because of this very pandemic that we are all facing currently. So I'm going to start without having to waste much of our time because we don't have enough time whilst we wait for the others to join. So today, we are going to look at a condition known as meningitis. We are going to look at a condition known as meningitis. Um, we've all heard about this very condition, be it on radio, on TV. We've also been fortunate somehow to meet patients with these conditions, being nurse on the ward or in hospitals who've ever had our clinical sessions. So today I'm going to give you um, a detailed description of this very condition, what goes into this very condition, when children or people tend to suffer this very condition. Please, you have to take it serious um, because in recent times there was an outbreak of uh, meningitis in the Upper East or is it Upper West? region of Ghana, and it was difficult being controlled, and nurses also had it difficult managing the child and all those stuff. So this is part of the knowledge set that will be required of us, so that in future when we are on the ward as professional nurses and midwives, we'll be able to cater for our patients with this very condition without having much to um, lead to complications by this very condition. So I will start, as I said, we don't have much time. There's also light off out here. So I'm going to start. We are going to look at a condition known as meningitis. Meningitis, I said we've heard about it. It is also known as a CSM, that is cerebrospinal meningitis. Um, some will say that there's a difference between what cerebrospinal meningitis is and what meningitis is. There is no specific difference. As we take in the lesson, we would get to understand the terminologies that are being used interchangeably in the course of this very condition in children. So I'm going to start with the anatomy and physiology of the system that is the central nervous system, specifically that of the brain and then the spinal cord now you can see a, v, a picture that is showing you some stuff. Now this picture is trying to show some parts of the head of an individual, specifically the scalp, then deep down the scalp or it goes beyond the scalp of an individual. So you have the skin of the scalp, you would have the peristium, then you have the bone of the scalp, you would have the dura mater, which is made up of the peristial layer, the meningeal layer, these are what makes up the dura mater, we have the arachnoid matter, and then we have the pia matter. Then beneath the pia matter, you would have what we call the green matter and then the white matter. That is specifically the brain itself. Now, you can also see that there are some blood vessels as well as nerves within these very layers. Now, if you look at it anatomically, you get to see that we have the dura matter, we have the arachnoid matter, and we have the pia matter. Now, if you look in between the dura matter and then the pia matter, you have what we call the arachnoid matter. Now, in the case of meningitis, these layers are going to be inflamed. Please, these layers are not only specifically to the brain. They do not cover only the brain. They run down to the spinal cord. So when somebody suffers this very condition, the causative organism is going to cause an inflammatory process within these layers. Now, these layers also contain some fluid known as the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, the more the infection sets in, 
the more this um, fluid would become passy or their nature would change. And that will tell you that the individual is sick of a particular condition affecting the coverings of the brain as well as the spinal cord. So the meninges are basically the coverings of the brain and then the spinal cord. So in this very condition, the effect is going to be on these very coverings. So what is the description or how do we define meningitis? We are saying that it is an inflammation of the brain and then the spinal meninges. I've already spoken about the meninges. The meninges are basically said are the coverings of the brain and the spinal cord. So this is a condition that is going to cause an inflammatory process within these coverings of the brain and the spinal cord. You can also see that it is an inflammation of the arachnoid and then the pyomata of the brain and spinal cord. You see when I was showing the earlier picture, we had the dura mater, we had the arachnoid mater, and we have the pia mater, which we all know that the arachnoid mater um, falls between the dura and then the pia mater. And we are saying that this one, the inflammation is basically within the space of the arachnoid and then the pia mater in another definition. Now, if you also look at the picture that has been put aside, you would get to see that the normal meninges are not swollen. The normal meninges are not inflamed. But in the case of the child or an individual suffering from meningitis, you tend to see that the meninges will become inflamed by a means of an infection. So the brain, which is much closer, or that is a covering of the brain and the spinal cord, the person will now tend to exhibit some signs and symptoms and that will make the condition something that needs an attention. Now, what causes meningitis? There are so many causes of meningitis, but literature will tell you that there are five causes of meningitis. Some will tell you there are four causes of meningitis, depending on whatever source of their information. But with the course of our lesson today, uh, meningitis can be caused by a bacterial, it can be caused by a virus, it can be caused by a fungus, it can be caused by a parasite known as a protozoa. It can also be caused by other chemicals or toxic exposure to an individual at a point in time. So these are the basic causes of meningitis in an individual or in a child as we know. Please, this topic of concern, I'm not specifically looking at only the pediatric population, but I'm taking much interest in um, all the populations that this condition will tend to affect. And this condition also affects all age groups. That one is important for you to take note of. Now, the picture is trying to tell you um, these causative organisms, how they look like when they are taken to the lab. That is the virus, the bacterial, and those stuff. Now, most of the literatures will tell you that there are two main types of meningitis. That is viral meningitis and bacterial meningitis. That is what most of the literatures will tell you. But if you advance in the knowledge of or in trying to understand what meningitis is, you would get to realize that basically there are five of them, but the main ones are two. That is viral and bacterial meningitis. What is the incident of meningitis within the world population, especially that of the pediatric own? We are saying that it is more common in infants as well as toddlers, as we all know who an infant is and who a toddler is. We are saying that notwithstanding it being more common in the infant and toddler, it can occur in all age groups. The incident of meningitis can also be said that um, when individuals are given certain vaccines or certain precautionary measures are put in place, the chances of individuals or children tending to suffer this meningitis tend to reduce. And as we all know, as part of the immunization schedules, children are given what we call the hip hep and all those stuff. This is purposely to um, reduce the, ch the child's chances of getting meningitis. Now we're saying that we have what we call neonatal meningitis, that is meningitis that tend to affect more of the neonate. And we're saying that when meningitis affects the neonate as early as possible, the chances of the neonate dying is very, very high. And then the chances of it leaving much complications behind is also very, very high in the case of the neonate. So we have to take much precautionary measures and understand this condition very perfectly. Now, I said meningitis can also, in terms of ratio as to the sex or gender, we are saying that meningitis tend to affect more of the males as compared to the females. 
there are so many reasons attributed to this very cause. We all know women are more careful as compared to males. We also know very well that women, when they are sick, they are likely to report to the nearest um, facility within the shortest possible time as compared to that of the male. And also the genetic makeup of the male and then that of the female also attributes or is, is a contributory factor to this very differentiation. In the case of the pediatric population, we are saying that the incident tends to increase when the baby is about the age of six to 12 months. We are saying that the highest time by which most of these children will die or chances of they having to be sick of this very condition is at the age of four years. We are saying meningitis more of the times happens in the course or in the days of um, rainy season or sometimes in the hamatan season or very cold environments that is when hamatan uh, that is when meningitis tend to be so high now the pro prognosis as to the chances of survival or recovery it depends on so many factors it depends on the child's age or the individual's age it depends on the causative organism and then it depends on as early as possible um, interventions that have been put in place that is in the administration of antibiotics or antiviral if that should be the case and then um, in the ability of the healthcare facility to manage some of the complications that may come alongside with meningitis these are factors that would determine the chances of survival or the magnitude of the condition in the case of an individual so as we've already learned the causes of meningitis, fortunate in the causes or with the causes of meningitis, it relates to the types of meningitis. So if it is caused by, or if a cause is viral, that means that there's going to be viral meningitis. If it is bacterial, it is going to be bacterial meningitis. So depending on the cause, the name takes that shape or that form. So I'm taking you through this one after the other. We are going to look at the first one known as bacterial meningitis. Please, bacterial meningitis is not the most common of all the meningitis, but it is the most dangerous of all the meningitis. We are saying that the causative organism for this very bacterial meningitis are streptococcus pneumonia, which can also be known as pneumococcal meningitis. Then we have the Nazarene meningitis, Tiditis, and that one is known as the meningococcal meningitis. We are saying that this meningococcal meningitis is the most common among the mening uh, bacterial meningitis, and it is also the most severe form of the bacterial meningitis. Please, let's take note of this for the purposes of our lenses as well as KNST exams. Now, hemophilus influenza can also cause meningitis. Staphylococcus aureus can also cause, E. coli can also cause meningitis, um, Pseudomonas can also cause meningitis in children or in the older population. Now, we are saying that meningococcal meningitis is the most common and the most severe of all the bacterial meningitis. Literature has shown that there are 12 types of this causative organism. There are 12 types of them. Now, these 12 types of them, six of them have been identified to most of the times cause um, epidemics. And the six are the A, B, C, W, and then Y. I would give you an opportunity to write. I said meningococcal meningitis is the most common and severe of the bacterial meningitis. The causative organism is the N -meningi meningitis. And then we are seeing that this very causative organism has six has 12 types but six of them are very dangerous or six of them causes an epidemic in a locality or in a country and the six are a b c w x and y now why am i so interested in these very um subtypes remember in recent times there were confusions all over ghana when this COVID condition was rearing in its head and it was sort of putting more people infected and getting some people dead. Meningitis also started somewhere in the Upper West region and it was also taking off people's life. There was a case of um, in a day or a week where it took about 45 lives in the Upper East region of Ghana. 
Now, people were complaining that the government was neg negligent in the course of um, attending to patients with meningitis. No, that wasn't the issue. In the case of meningitis, specifically the meningococcal, there is a specific vaccine that has been developed. But what happened in the Upper East or in the Upper West region of Ghana was that the strain, the type of men, uh, meningococcal uh, meningitis was different from what the Ghanaian healthcare system knew of. It was also different from what WHO was more comfortable with in terms of preventive measures or treatment regimens for that type of meningitis. That is why it took so many lives in the Upper West region before an intervention was put in place. And now we know more here of meningitis having to kill people in this Advent um, period or era of COVID-2019. So this picture is also telling you what happens when the bacterial get access into the meninges or the caverns or surroundings of the brain and the spinal cord is going to cause the layers to become inflamed. Now, when these layers become inflamed, it goes a long way to also affect the brain itself. And when it affects the brain itself, there's going to be so many complications that would arise from here. So that is where some would want to call it cerebrospinal meningitis. Now, bacterial meningitis can also be known as septic meningitis. Why are we saying septic meningitis? Because of its ability to cause much um, infection within the blood stream of the individual. And for that matter, it can move from one part to the other and bring out other complications that are not desirable. So what is the incident of bacterial meningitis? We are saying that bacterial meningitis is more common when the weather is very cold, that is in the rainy season or in the earlier stages of hamatan. We are saying that when this happens, um, people that tend to have upper respiratory tract in, uh, infection um, would have more of this incident occurring within themselves or within their population. We're also saying that when the environment is also cool, that is when people tend to suffer upper respiratory tract infections. And that would give the bacterial or the bacterium the opportunity to infect the next person. We're saying bacterial meningitis in terms of percentage wise is 90% um, in children that are older than five years old. What are the risk factors as to somebody developing bacterial meningitis? Some of the risk factors is that when people are in dense population, that is when you are in crowded environments, then there are chances that you would get yourself infected with meningitis. So for instance, you being students and where you are kept in a hostel room of 12 people in a very small cubicle, there are chances that if somebody has bacterial meningitis or any sort of meningitis, you are likely to get it. So examples have been cited as college dormitories. Um, people that are found in prisons, more of the times are also having the chances of suffering from what we call bacterial meningitis as a predisposing factor or a risk factor. What is the mode of transmission with regards to bacterial meningitis? This one will also go alongside for the other bacteria, other meningitis, uh, meningitis. But here I'm looking specifically to bacterial meningitis because that is what is most common with us in our locality. And that is what is most severe within our locality. So we are saying that the mode by which this bacterium will get access into the meninges of the brain and the spinal cord is going to be through an injury that is a traumatic injury to the skull. That is if the person is involved in any road, um, road traffic accident and then there's an opening in the skull, this bacterium may get access into that and then go to inflame the meninges. We're also saying that this infection can also occur from sinus infections. We all know what the sinus are. They are found just some away, some meters or distance away from the nose. So we are saying that when these causative organisms are found in there, they can travel through these very means into the meninges and then they will cause more problems to the individual. We've also spoken about some head injuries under the skull fracture. So it is more or less in relation to that now, if an individual also has a penetrating wound to the spinal cord or even to the head, 
or somewhere closer to the neck of an individual. This bacteria may also get an access and then go to inflame or cause inflammatory process of the meninges. Another means by which somebody can also get bacterial meningitis is through neurosurgery. When the person has had a condition that requires a surgery of the scalp of or the nervous system, there are chances that in the course of the surgery, some infections or um, microorganisms might get, might get access into the brain and then start to cause an infection. Or after the surgery, there can be lack of proper um, compliance with an um, aseptic technique and the individual would have this infection setting in. We're also saying that it can also be by means of blood bond, that is where the infection may pass through any other means, maybe through an IV cannula that has been set in there. When the nurses don't take much precaution in the daily care of the side of the cannula, an infection can get access through that, go through the bloodstream, then get into the meninges, and then it will start to cause this inflammatory process. I've already spoken about the sinus and upper respiratory tract infections, but let me also speak to the upper respiratory tract infections. In the cases where people tend to suffer conditions like otitis media, um, having common cold, sometimes the causative organism may be one of these bacteria and they can travel as far into the brain and then start to cause this very condition known as meningitis. We're also saying that in the case of an individual using NASA spray, this can also attribute or contribute the chances of an individual getting what we call bacterial meningitis. Now, the next type of meningitis we are going to look at is what we call the viral meningitis. It is also known as the septic meningitis. I said the bacterial meningitis can be known as um, septic meningitis but this one is known as aseptic meningitis. Sorry for the earlier omission. Now, what goes into viral or aseptic meningitis? We are saying that this meningitis normally occurs when the individual has suffered some form of viral infection, like having to suffer some mom's infection, some herpes syphilis or zoster. That is, if you have chicken pox, this, the causative organism of chicken pox known as the varicella zoster, when it gets access into the spinal cord or the brain, it can lead to what we call viral meningitis. There are so many viruses, when they get access into um, the spinal cord or the brain, they can cause what we call the viral meningitis. Even this very coronavirus we are dealing with currently can also cause what we call viral meningitis when it gets access to the meninges. By saying that, as we all know, most of the times, um, viral infections do not require much of an intensive care. The individual just needs to have some supportive form of care. The individual just has to get some amount of rest, and then the individual would have to eat more or have some better nutrition in order to boost the immune system of the individual. And then these viral infections will go off by itself. So we see that it is self-limiting. And then it does not require a long period of hospitalization if there's a need for so. Now, as I stated earlier, uh, mening viral meningitis is the most common type of meningitis, but it is not a severe form of meningitis. The severe form or type of meningitis is bacterial meningitis. We are saying that viral meningitis is self-limiting. It will go off by itself without much intervention. The only key words are that the person should have good nutrition, the person should have adequate um, rest, the person should have some form of um, drugs that would help boost the immune system. That is all that is required for this very person, and then the person will recover as early as possible. Let's look at what we call the viral, uh, the fungal meningitis. Meningitis can also be caused by fungal, as we stated earlier. We are seeing that this condition normally occurs in patients, uh, in patients whose immune system are compromised or are suppressed. This immune system can be compromised or suppressed by means of medication, by means of malnutrition, by means of certain disease conditions that would not help the immune system to fight infections that tend to come in. Now, I think that more of the time, this fungal meningitis would occur when the causative organism gets access into the bloodstream and then it goes through the bloodstream into the central nervous system. And this can be by means of direct or indirect contamination of the blood. 
and that will lead to somebody suffering from what we call fungal meningitis. But please, fungal meningitis is very rare or is less common among the two as has been spoken earlier. We are saying that one of the common causes or causative organism with regards to fungal meningitis is known as a um, cryptococcus pneumophomas. Please take note of it, cryptococcus pneumophomas. We are saying that that is the most common um, fungal infection in the case of meningitis. What is the mode of transmission for all meningitis? What is the mode of transmission for all meningitis? We are saying that meningitis affect only the human population. We are saying that especially the end meningitis. And we are saying that it has no animal reservoir. That is, it does not go to stay in the animal before it is transmitted. Some of them can be done that way, but with the most common ones that we are dealing with in the human population, it has no barrier or no relation with that. Now, we are saying that the mode of transmission is from person to person through droplets of respiratory or what we call truth secretions of carriers. Why are we talking of carriers? We have people that have this... Um, causative organisms within them. But these causative organisms have not traveled into the central nervous system. So for that matter, it is not causing any sort of infection to them. We all know what we call the normal flora. And then when they move, they become pathogenic. When they move to areas they are not supposed to be, they become pathogenic. That is what happens in the case of this very condition. So in simple terms, meningitis can be contracted by means of contact, that is be it direct or indirect. When you come into contact with the contaminated article or substance, you can get it. And when you come into contact with secretions coming from the nostrils or the mouth of an individual with this very condition, you can also get it. And we are saying that it is by means of contact and then airborne droplets. Please take note of this very uh, mode of transmissions. It is not, it is in your book but I didn't go further as it is here. Now we have the incubation period. The incubation period will take us two to 14 days. The incubation period for meningitis is two to 14 days. Incubation period for meningitis is two to 14 days. And this one depends on the actual or the specific causative organism, which we've already stated or spoken of earlier on. So these are the very important things we have to take note of. What are the clinical presentations an individual with meningitis would come with to us as healthcare professionals? Please, this one has been grouped according to the age categories um, because of our interest as pediatric nurses or having to work on the pediatric population. So the first group is going to look into the neonates. So we are seeing that a neonate that tends to suffer meningitis is going to have a subnormal temperature or a low grade temperature. So the temperature will be very low. But in the case of bacterial meningitis, when the condition becomes so severe, the temperature becomes high. Please, these signs and symptoms are not much specific to the causative organisms. But some literatures will group them according to the causative organisms. But I would want to tell you that in all it runs through is the same signs and symptoms with the exception of some few specific ones. There is also going to be pallor or paleness of the individual in the case of um, the neonate. We're also seeing that the neonate is also going to be lethargic, which we've already learned much about in some studies of ours. The infant is also going to be irritable with a list of provocation. He turns off. And then there's going to be poor feeding or sucking in the case of the neonate. This neonate will also tend to suffer. That is when the meninges become so inflamed that it affects the brain. It will cause some vomiting. There is going to be convulsive fits being suffered or being experienced by children or newness suffering meningitis. There is going to be rigidity and hyperextension of the neck. I will show you a picture of this very one. The child becomes so rigid. When you tie the patient, the child's system or body is so stiff, the muscles become so contracted. That is what is going to happen. So we are saying that there are cases where the child will also have some episodes of diarrhea. And then in the case of the neonate, one key thing we have to take note of for the neonate is the bulging or tense frontanals. 
please. It's one of the key um, signs or signs and symptoms of the neonate in terms of meningitis. So the key ones for the neonate is a bulking or tense fontanelles. You can underline that the rigidity and hyperextension of the neck, the scissors, then the vomiting, the poor feeding and suckling, and then the sub temperature as well as the irritability. So this is a picture trying to give us much understanding of the signs and symptoms as has been relayed. So we have the babies and the toddlers. The baby will have the fever. I said the fever may be substandard, but as condition progresses, it may be high grade. Then they would have cold hands or extremities and then they would become fretful, that is they easily become irritated and they would not want to be handled. They are going to have rapid respiration as a condition progresses. They are going to also cry unusual or abnormally. They are going to have the stiff neck as we explained earlier, that is the stiffness of the body. And then they will not like to have bright light. That is a common feature of meningitis in every age population, what we call photophobia is going to happen. The child is going to refuse feed and also this child would vomit if in terms, in case he takes in the feed. This child look a bit drowsy. That is the lethargic aspect we spoke of. He may be floppy on, and unresponsive. Then the child may look pale. There is going to be some form of rashes on the skin of the child. Then the fontanelles, as we said, the fontanelles, as we said, is going to be tense and bulging. And then this child is going to have convulsive fits. So these pictures are all trying to um, buttress what we've just spoken of. The high pitch cry is the same we've spoken of. We've spoken of everything here. So take note of it. I'll give you opportunity if you want to pick them up. If you are not picking them up, then I would go forward to continue with what is necessary. So we have the clinical presentations in the case of the infant and then the young child. We are saying this child is also going to be lethargic just as the new unit, is going to be irritable just as the new unit, is going to show signs of pallor just as in the new unit. There's going to be anorexia or poor feeding just as in the new unit. Then there's going to be nausea and vomiting in the case of this very one. There's going to be increased crying. Then there's going to be the insistency on being held. Here the child wants to be held. He would want to be picked or he would want to refuse being held. It can be the opposite of all. There's also going to be increased intracranial pressure. So what are the signs of increased intracranial pressure? There's going to be bulging eyes. There is going to be the high pitched cry. These are possible signs of increased intracranial pressure. And then you would get to see that the child's um, front tunnels are going to be bulking. Then there is going to be increased head circumference in the case of the infant and then the young child. This child also suffer what we call the convulsive fits or the seizures. And as I said, we have what we call the sunset eyes. Because of the increase in tracheal pressure, the child's eyes will look at it is popping out. It is coming out. That is what it means by the sunset eyes. And always the eyes will be wide open. That is what it means by this. So these are some of the basic things you see in a child that is a bit younger than the new unit. Now, in the older child, what are the signs and symptoms that will be seen? The older, the older child can complain of headache. Please, headache and all those stuff can happen in the new unit, but they cannot complain. That is why it has not been captured specifically in there. But the older child can complain of severe headache. He can also um, be checked for fever. The older child will have what we call projectile vomiting. That is where the vomit tools will move a distance away from where the child is. The older child also shows signs of irritability. The older, the older child would also tell you that he has problem with the bright light. That is what we call photophobia. The older child is also going to have the stiffness of the body and the neck, just as in the other age categories we've spoken of. Now, one key thing that we would have to take note in the case of meningitis is that we have what we call the positive canine sign. Um, somebody asked a question the other time of which I said the answer was positive canine sign. What is positive canine sign? 
positive canine sign is inability to extend the leg when the hip and then the knees are flexed. And another circumstance, if you are lying down and then your legs are extended or your neck is extended, the hips as well as the knees are not supposed to extend in line with that. But in the case of um, positive canine sign, as you can see from the picture, the other leg is being down. When this leg, the leg is held and it's been extended, it's been straightened, you would get to realize that the child will raise up the neck as well as the other leg that is down, the nose will also become flexed. That is what we call the canine sign. Please, I'm saying that when you are extending the neck of the child, there won't be much a problem. But here with the canine sign, when you try to extend the leg, one leg of the child, you see that the baby will raise the head up. Then the other leg that is lying in an extended form would also try to flex. The knee will try to flex in aid of the leg that has been extended. Why? Because there's going to be what we call pain. And that pain is what is letting the child move those body parts. Now, when the baby moves those body parts, the baby tends to have some amount of comfort. That is why the child would assume that. So this picture, the second picture B is showing you what the positive canine sign means. We have what we call positive Brzezinski sign. Positive Brzezinski sign. We are saying that the child flexes the knees and hips in response to passive neck extension. Now, when you try to uh, flexion, when you try to flex the neck, please, the difference here is that here, when you try to flex the neck, you would get to realize that the lower extremities, that is the legs, that are extended will become flexed or they would also want to flex in support of the neck. Please, the difference between the Brzezinski's and the canine is that with a canine, it is the leg that is being extended. Now, when you extend the neck, the leg, the leg, as well, the other leg as well as the neck would